Good morning and welcome everybody to this week's How We Heal series. Um, today we have a panel discussion with Jennifer Polanski, Tom Perrick and Michelle Meehan on the topic, Finding Purpose and Meaning. So I'd like to welcome you all. Uh, first, I'll, I'll start with just giving you an overview of how our format will be today. And um, give gratitude as well to, to those who, who gave their questions already in advance. They, I have received a few by email. Um, I would like to invite you all, if you do have questions that, that come up over the course of, of the discussion today, to please write them in the chat box and um, I'll make sure to include them. Um, so finding meaning and purpose is, part, is one of many topics that we've been covering on the How We he Heal series. Uh, the, the series was really a response from the Inarts Collective and the members of the Inarts Collective to a range of issues that people are experiencing as a result of COVID. Um, and we wanted to provide some support and resources and different perspectives on um, how to move through the, these challenging times. But more broadly than that, we also uh, would like to ensure that, that the conversations that we have today can help people moving forward beyond COVID. Um, the themes are, are timeless in many ways. So while we're going to be talking about finding me meaning and purpose today in relation to the to what's going on with folks right now. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, Tom, and Michelle have a, a long extensive history with working with people in finding purpose and meaning in the past. Um, so through their, through their various practices. Um, I'm going to, to they're, they're each going to be introducing themselves and what brought them to this topic. Um, just like three to five minutes each. And then we'll start with a, a sequence of curated discussions that we have. Um, very good question. Some of the questions we have um, are from members, um, and many of them are from participants. So we have uh, the floor for one hour today. I'd like to end on time just to respect everybody's everybody's time, and um, I'll be following up after. The end of the series to uh, to give each of you a copy of the video as well as a supporting document with <clears throat> different different tools and strategies that um, end up getting spoken about within the discussion. If we have time at the end, I would like to open the floor up to uh, to you as participants to share amongst each other some things that have helped you in finding meaning and purpose and you know, the, there's a lot of expertise in the room and um, we wanna make sure that you can also benefit from that. Um, but if our conversations are really moving and we're, you know, in, in, a, in great conversation, um, answering these questions, then, um, then we, might, we might not have time at the end for that. But I do want you to know that I'm holding, um, holding that in mind and keeping, keeping it hopeful that we'll have some time at the end for you to share resources with each other. So without further ado, um, I'd like to open the floor to, um, to our panelists here to introduce yourself, um, your work, and what brings you to the topic of meaning, finding meaning and purpose. Who would like to get started? So I'll begin. Hello everyone, my name is Jennifer and what I do is mainly working with women to create sacred, safe space for them to come home to themselves, to come home to their body, to tune into their hearts. We do a lot of womb work, clearing the womb, um, transmuting old programs, patterns that, that keep us in those, those thought loops and clearing them out and embodying these practices. Um, and what brought me to this, and particularly the theme of meaning and purpose, is that I, for so many years, was doing what I thought I was supposed to be doing in order to be happy, in order to be accepted by society, ticking off all the boxes, and somehow I was 
still always feeling unsettled. I was still always feeling like something's missing. And it was only when I started getting really deep into meditation yoga and I started studying Tantra and working with a teacher that I actually started to feel full. And it was when I was part of a sisterhood, a sacred sisterhood, supportive women around me, that it was really the first time that I felt like I was actually part of something. And so that's a real key for me is the community aspect of it, is doing that inner work and getting comfortable really looking at ourselves and then feeling like we're held um, in that space. Thank you. Really excited to be here. Thank you, Jennifer. Tom or Michelle, would either of you like to? Be nice? Sure, maybe to keep the order, right? <laughs> uh, so, hello to everyone. I am an addiction counselor and uh, psychotherapist, working uh, primarily with men from let's say late 20s to they are 50s and that's very interesting uh, age range because these men are typically well-functioning individuals gainfully employed who have some relationships significant relationships but they find themselves in, in a kind of uh, stuck position because they had developed certain addictive behaviors that they started realizing are not helping them reach the goals they want for themselves in their lives. So th that's it. And they, they, make, they made a decision to do something about it and change. So to leave the old patterns and eventually to step into a new form of life. And this time for them is a very anxious time, which is very understandable because they are facing a, a new possibilities, not knowing exactly how to go into them and realize them. And for me, this is very exciting because I really uh, find it's an it's important moment in life. It's not too late. It's never too late, but especially this period is not too late to make a significant change. And if I can be uh, helpful in any way uh, for them in this process, I, I feel gratified in, in, my, in my work. So maybe this would be enough uh, for an introduction and I'll, I'll, I'll add something or more else during the conversation. Thank you, Tom. Michelle? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Michelle Meehan. I'm a psychotherapist and shamanic practitioner. And I really felt called to uh, participate in this panel discussion because a lot of my career has been involved in working with people that have had a traumatic injury or the onset of a disability that disrupts their life and often forces them into the question of what brings meaning and purpose. It often takes people out of the activities that they thought gave them meaning and purpose. Um, and I've seen people, I've supported people to navigate through that transition successfully. Some people um, find even sort of a deeper meaning. Uh, their, their path gets disrupted, but they, they find something that's even richer for them. Whereas I've also seen people just not navigate that successfully and, and get stuck in the grief and the loss. So part of my work is also in, in helping people um, with career choices. And uh, again, disability can, 
can disrupt what people are doing for a living. But in my uh, part of my practice is also a more general uh, private practice, and this issue comes up a lot. So even without disruption, I hear a lot of people, you know, longing for that sense of meaning and purpose, and thinking that somehow a career change is going to uh, do that for them. And one of the things that I've learned is that's that's a myth. It's just not true. Um, and so that's that's made me think, well, what is it? What's underneath that? What is it that truly gives us meaning and purpose? So I'll, we'll talk more about that from various or various perspectives as we go through. Thank you, Michelle. Um, Wonderful. That's a, that was a great introduction um, from each of you. And it gives way to, to one of our first questions um, from Vanetta. Actually, a couple people asked this, Vanetta and somebody else who asked to be anonymous. Um, how do I create meaning and purpose? Um, sorry, how do I create a purpose in my life and live a purposeful life? What practice would you recommend? to connect with deeper meaning? I know it's a big question. Would you like me to repeat it? Sure, yes, yes please. How to create a purpose in my life and live a purposeful life. What practices would you recommend to connect with a deeper sense of meaning? Love to touch on that. The first thing that comes up for me is this question of how do I create purpose? And for me, uh, and what I've seen in my work is that purpose isn't created, it's discovered. And we've been taught from such a young age to look outside of ourselves for validation, for someone to tell us, did I do this right? Is this the right way to do it? when really it, it so much comes from, from within us. And so that's, that's my first um, invitation is, is to perhaps start asking, uh, asking it in a different way, is what's, what's the purpose within me rather than um, creating it? And then, and then how, some practices, you know, meditation is a great one. And going in with, with an actual question, for me, especially when working with women, we, we go straight to the womb. Uh, like we start off this idea of, of a soul heart, um, you know, dropping the mind down into the heart so that we're not thinking about purpose, but rather feeling into it. And so visualizing um, the breath coming into the heart and then coming down into the womb. And even for men, men have a womb center, an energetic womb center. And this is really where all of our dreams and our visions live. It's also where our ancestral um, DNA and the ancestral uh, patterning and conditioning lives in our small intestines. And so it can get a bit um, clouded, which is where the clearing work comes in. But simply tuning into these centers in the body helps to unlock um, our, own, our own self, our own inner voice. And that's where, that's where those messages come from. And on a, on a practical level, looking at what makes me happy? What do I love to do? And it doesn't have to be tied to a career. I think that's where a lot of people get tripped up is when they're asked, well, what do you love to do? We think of it in relation to something that I could be paid for. But just start with the question, what do you love to do? What actually makes you happy? And, and go from there. I'll leave that there so that, so that Michelle and Tom can chime in as well. Thanks. So I can jump in on this. I was thinking about this question this morning or something very similar. And um, I was what came to mind was the quote um, by Mother Teresa, that there are no great acts, there are small acts done with great love. So it, for me, part of what that 
that is speaking to is purpose comes not from anything that we do, but from what we bring to what we do. So we find purpose when we show up with our authenticity, when we're centered from, you know, what we most love and value in the world. And I mean, from an intrinsic place. So it's an inter it's an inner job. So do, you know, it, it, are we guided by love? Are we guided for feeling passionate about protecting life or nurturing life? Uh, are, we, are we guided by uh, interconnect, our interconnectedness? You know, whatever those words are for you that feel juicy, if you bring that to everything that you do or, or just the way you are in the world, we create purpose. <laughs> We, or purpose blooms in that space. And, you know, I'm reminded of an old colleague of mine who um, had sustained a brain injury and, you know, as I said in the beginning, had you know, really struggled with finding his place in the world after that. And I remember him giving a talk and saying, I mean, does the world need one more stressed out stockbroker staring at their phone while they're rushing off? Um, or does the world need, you know, maybe it's a person with a brain injury, but that's sitting peacefully on a park bench appreciating the beauty of the trees. So, you know, who are you? How are you showing up in the world? What are you emanating? And for me, that's just really rich with, with purpose. Thank you. So, so if, I, if I can jump in here. Uh, yes, this question is one of the key ones, of course, because we are all looking for uh, an answer or answers, because we need to be aware that meaning and purpose, whatever it is, if we uh, happen to believe that we know, are not fixed, not sta static. They change, they shift uh, following our developmental trajectory in lives and different circumstances in life. So, so that's, that's something that we are asking ourselves all the time. And in answering this uh, call that is uh, in the, at the heart of this question, uh, I think what's important first is to simply reflect on our life experiences to start with. Uh, and it is true that a life or life experiences do not necessarily teach us anything unless we reflect on those. Mm -hmm. So unless we spend some time trying to figure out what the messages we can derive from what we had experienced. And to support this process, we can use, of course, uh, different, uh, uh, let's call them methods or strategies. Uh, one that I always suggest, probably because it's important for me, is reading good books. So do, doing your own bibliotherapy. Uh, reading good books is actually talking with the wisdom of the past. And by engaging in this uh, discourse with these voices of wisdom, we can also help ourselves to understand our life better. So the result of this reflection can be some, some, some clarity in terms of what's our purpose here? What are we meant to do and how we are meant to be here? Uh, another practice to support this process of self-reflection is certainly um, talking to other people directly, good friends or maybe a therapist who is, who is uh, immersed in these questions. 
And of course, another practice is to have some kind of uh, meditation or contemplative practice and hopefully a daily practice because these small moments in, in, in a day when they are accumulating create a possibility for us to really gain some, some deeper insight into what's really going on and what we should be doing in order to meet uh, the important values in our life. Uh, and maybe, maybe to suggest another practice that can be helpful. This is what comes to mind uh, right now is to ask, yeah, it's a simple kind of funny question that I have done with my clients and my students as well, uh, to ask them to write an answer to the one and only question. And the question is, who am I? But to write it like 20 or 30 times. And that's interesting. And you can use only one word. So, of course, people usually start with something that is more obvious, that, that is more uh, kind of so, socially, socially visible uh, aspect of themselves. For example, I'm, I'm a woman, or I'm, I'm, I'm a brother, or I'm a friend, or I'm, you know, can, Canadian, or, or I am, you know, African Canadian, or, or, or whatever, right? I, I'm a student, I'm a, you know, professional of some kind. And then after a while, it becomes more difficult because these more obvious aspects are kind of uh, used up. And now that these are the moments when people need to go deeper into themselves. And this, this uh, exercise actually sometimes helps people to, first of all, uh, become more introspective and out of this uh, process of introspection, maybe some, some interesting answers, answers can, can come up. So these are, these are a few simple kind of uh, practical uh, exercises that I, I, would, I would suggest uh, you know, for people to, to use because they may be, may be useful. Well, you guys all offered some, some amazing practices. And um, we had a couple, a couple participants ask specifically um, about the challenges and hurdles that they face in life. Um, like one person had asked about how to scale back so they can actually focus on their purpose and their meaning because the hurdles just seem to get in the way. Um, so that they can express their purpose more every day. And I think some of the practices that you guys just mentioned around meditation, uh, breathing into the heart and the womb space, um, the multiple practices that you just suggested, um, Tom, and the self-reflective practices that you suggested, Michelle. Um, like I, I, I think that those are, those are some really amazing um, techniques to cope also with the challenges in everyday life and kind of slow things down so that you can get some clarity. So I do, I do think that the, the question asked by a couple participants about challenges in that respect were answered. But there's another layer to challenges that got brought up by a couple other participants. And um, one was asking uh, more specifically about how challenges can be used or um, applied as a, as a tool to clarify. Like, is there a purpose that challenges have to play in our, our meaning and purpose, our finding meaning and purpose? You know, these challenges keep coming up. Are they, are they tools for learning? Are they tools for, are they, are they teaching us something? Do you find that coming up in your practice? And do you have any suggestions for how people can, can translate challenges into something that actually gives them greater, deeper meaning and purpose? Yeah. 
Okay. I, I, I feel like if I'm, if it's left to me, I'll always go first. I will always pick up a stick, but I want to give everyone an opportunity. So I'm just going to sit here and, and listen for a moment. So, I mean, I can, I can jump in on this. I think for sure. I mean, I see that all the time with many of the people that I've helped over the years as they face a really sometimes enormous challenge. Um, and it can be a great clarifier. Um, you know, those times when life demands that we do things differently. Uh, as I mean, we're all kind of facing that now, right? We've had to, we've had to shift uh, the way we're interacting with each other in the world. Um, so we have a shared experience of a challenge, but everybody has their own unique path. But they, they do ask us to say, you know, to clarify values, what's important, what's essential here? Where, where is my time and my energy most impactful? I think some of those questions help us navigate through those times um, most effectively. And even if, I know I've had, I've had times of challenge where I feel like what it's demanding of me, it creates a stress and attention in where I maybe want my time and my energy to go or even where I think I'm most impactful, but that's clarifying. That brings new information into my awareness. So, you know, sometimes I have to say, okay, this moment is demanding something else of me, but when this moment passes, I know more clearly that where I want to be focused is in a different way or in a different direction. And then, you know, going back to what I said earlier, we can always bring our presence, our authenticity, our love and our light to whatever is unfolding in front of us. Yes, yes. Uh, in, in my own practice, working mainly with uh, people with addictions, uh, I actually face uh, this question of how to use life challenges in, uh, in a skillful way to develop a different form of life. It's a, it's a big question, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's a really a, a, a central impetus in, in, in addiction. Uh, I remember when I, started, when I started working in the field, uh, which was some 20 years ago. Uh, I was in a residential treatment center and we, we had a daily meeting, group meeting at two o'clock, I still remember, uh, during which uh, people would discuss different uh, topics. Uh, sometimes these topics were predetermined, sometimes they would come out of the conversation that we initially started having. And I clearly remember uh, one guy who was in recovery from cocaine use. And he, he was talking about really extremely dangerous practices <laughs> that he engaged in during his uh, career of heavy excessive cocaine use uh, to such a degree that, uh, that many times actually his life was in danger. And people were wondering, including myself, okay, how, how come that, that, that you knowing how vulnerable you, you were, he had some kind of heart, heart problems. And cocaine is not, not, not a uh, good substance to use when you have heart conditions, of course. Uh, so how, how, how come that you did not take that into account in, in how you used? And he said something that stayed with me all these years, which opened up my awareness toward this uh, uh, crucial crucial meaning of challenging times like addiction. And he said, oh, 
I'm not af I, I wasn't afraid of dying, but I was afraid of living. So for me, that was quite a revelation, especially because I was at the very beginning, beginning of my career in addictions, in addiction counseling. And, and that actually, excuse me, it seems to be my phone. I will just disconnect it. Uh, sorry about this. Life interferes when you have better plans to do, right? Uh, yeah, so so uh, addiction per se is, is a... Uh, Hi, good morning. I'm calling from Health Health Medicine from Dr. Greenaway's office. Could you please give us a call? <laughs> sorry again. So, yes, addiction is, is such a human condition that kind of brings into sharp focus the, the basic dilemma in life. And that's, first of all, whether to live. Because it's, it's not always uh, easy to answer. And the other is how to live, right? How to live well. So right away in, in this condition of addiction, uh, these questions are, are coming up as, as the major ones. And when we think about recovery as an attempt to leave addictions behind and develop, uh, and learn new ways of living, it's about regaining meaning. It's about finding a new purpose, finding a new meaning to life. So working with addictions, these questions are, are really, really most important ones in my mind. Thank you, Bill. Um... I'll say that one of the most, potentially the most freeing thing that ever happened to me was starting to realize and understand that all of the challenges in my life actually brought incredible gifts. And the practice of, of seeing the challenges as something to learn from and something that I created. I think that's a big part of this, is learning how to lovingly take responsibility for what comes into our life and to recognize that on an energetic, very scientific molecular level, we attract and repel energy from, from our field. And so when we attract something into our life, there's a reason for it. And it's the practice of saying, thank you. What do you have to teach me? And leaving it at that. And there's something so powerful in just asking the question, what can I learn from this? And then leaving it there. And by giving space, it's like when you try and hold on to something really tight, it tends to slip through our fingers. But if we open our hands and, and give it some space, then we can actually start to see the medicine in the, in the challenge. And um, let's see if there's anything else I wanted to say around that. Really coming to a place of of inquiring into, hmm, why did I call this into my life? Yeah, yeah, I'll say that much. Thank you, Thank you Jen. Um, I'm just reading in our chat box, there's um, been some discussions with Jem about um, having children and also having a wanderlust, a, a desire to travel, adventure, but also needing this, this sense of stability for her child. Um, how to avoid choosing stability completely and then be unhappy because that's one aspect of her responsibilities in life. Um, 
how to believe in what might not be societal expectations for family. You know, how to have that courage to, to do things differently. Um, it, it sounds like, Jem, um, it's difficult uh, for you to, to have children and have these expectations around creating a stable home for, for a family and for your child uh, or children. And at the same time, you have got this great desire to travel and adventure and, and in, your, in, your, in your eyes, they, they conflict and uh, you're concerned about um, unhappiness and not um, being in alignment with um, your full purpose. And um, does, that, does that make sense, Jem? Um, she's saying yes, because travel and writing is her purpose. So she's feeling like her responsibilities are, um, are in a way preventing her from, from going after her uh, and achieving her sense of purpose and fulfillment in life. Um, Can I chime in really quickly? Yeah, please, Jim. Um, just specifically with 2020 and everything that's been happening and where life is going, um, I'm trying to avoid the, the going down the path of, you know, because of fear, you need to just be stable. You need to have stability because that's more important for where life is going. It looks scary. And just how to keep those dreams alive and believe that your real purpose can be secure and you can be happy instead of choosing the fear-based route of um, yeah, things are getting really icky and it's time to buckle down and just think stability, family. I have one child, I'm a single mom, and just um, that's the stance I'm coming from. Thank you. Is anything uh, coming to mind, guys, to, to support Jem through this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for asking that question. Um, right away, and then you, you said it yourself when you, when you spoke, but right away what came to me was, ah, yes, this is, this is a limiting belief. And for completely understandable reason, it's the society that we live in. And so for me personally, I love working with proclamations and they're different than affirmations because affirmations, uh, when we, when we use them without addressing the underlying fear or core limiting belief, then the subconscious will, will take over uh, and, and still create the reality, uh, create our reality based on the subconscious fears, even though in our conscious we're saying these affirmations. And so uh, to, to v very, very uh, simplify it, very much simplify it it's uh, clearing aligning proclaiming and so whatever whatever feels right for you of sitting in a in a sacred space taking a moment closing your eyes hand on your heart and i release i'm releasing all energies that are not mine i am the only thinker in my mind i'm the only feeler in my body and and taking a few minutes to using some, some clearing herbs, um, some kind of, of exercise of, I am clearing myself of all energies that are not mine. I'm, I am practicing this divine detachment um, to you know, any, any energy field that is not mine. I'm cleansing and clearing. And then breathing into the heart, breathing into the heart, exhaling to feel this, this pillar of light all around you and, and aligning yourself into into a pillar of light and moving through this very, very quickly. And then the, the third part is, okay, what is the reality that I wish to create? And I love to start by using the violet flame. I place into the violet flame any, any fears or beliefs that I cannot um, both be stable and live my, my wanderlust life. And any of those limiting beliefs that come in I place those into the violet flame. I allow those to cleanse and clear now. And from this space, I am choosing to create a new reality. And then you proclaim, I choose to create the reality that, and then speak into what you want to create. And this can take five minutes. But do this every day 
and start to watch your world shift. It's, uh, it's really quite incredible. So that's my suggestion. Thank you, Jen. Tom and Michelle, do you have anything to share? No, I, I mean, I think what came up for me is that, uh, you know, world events have really asked us to um, rethink things, to, you know, suspend our expectations and suspend our usual way of doing things. And um, I think that this time calls for us to, to like anything is possible, but it may not look the way it did in the past or the way we expect it to. So, um, you know, coming to present moment awareness, coming to, you know, really feeling into what am I being called to do now? And, and holding space for that, you know, transformation uh, happens. I, my experience has been on its own timeline. We can't will it in any particular way. We can, we can fuel it, but we can't say, okay, I'm going to transform for tomorrow or for next week. We just do the work and put one front, one foot in front of the other with some trust and some faith and it happens. Thank you. Jem? Thank you guys. That actually is very, very helpful and I will be using all of that advice. Thank you so much, Michelle and Jennifer. Wonderful. Thanks guys. Um, I have another question here. Um, and this is about the, it brings things more into a, a social or a community lens. Um, can you please give me your perspective, give us your perspective on what might be the benefits to creating shared meaning and purpose with our families, organizations, and communities? Like we have, we have vision statements with, or within companies and organizations. We have like a shared sense of purpose that we, that we enlist in. Um, often it doesn't happen within families and uh, we see people kind of mobilizing in a community space around shared values or what they think needs to be done. But um, with, within this, like, like what, is, what is our individual purpose and how, what is the relationship between our individual purpose and the collective family organization, community purpose and meaning? And do you have any suggestions for how we can create greater alignment as, uh, as communities? Okay, so I, I actually believe that when we, when we begin to tune in with community and family, it becomes quite clear that we're all actually striving for the same meaning and purpose. And I think that's a, a super important thing to, to bring awareness to is that when, when you ask people, what do you want? What do you want to see in the world? What do you want? What do, what do people say? I want peace. I want love. I want to feel happy. We all want the same things. And so when it comes to meaning and purpose, they're all intrinsically connected. So we can say that you know, my, my purpose is, is my my meaning and purpose but really it has very little to do with me and it has much more with what i want to see in the world and it was the time i took to, to tune into myself and to be in community and share my dreams and visions with community to see to realize that wait a second we do all want the same thing and we are all going through the same thing that's the, that's the kicker is that we're all moving through this very similar programs. 
uh, very similar limiting beliefs. And when we really gather in community and share in our dreams and visions, I think it becomes so much easier. So that's, that's my answer of, of why it's important to share in meaning and purpose with community is to help ourselves be even stronger on an individual level, which then allows us to show up better in the community, which creates stronger individuals, which then continues the, um, the snowball, the snowball of love. Thank you. Tom or Michelle, do you have anything to add about, about this? Yeah, I, um, I, a couple of thoughts come to my mind. It's one, you know, we're all interdependent. Uh, and I think that's become increasingly clear to me. And again, I think in this time of pandemic, we're really getting a different level of the lesson about how our actions impact on other people, potentially. Um, but that's always true. And not only do our actions impact on other people, they impact on, you know, the air, the water, the plants, the animals that we share the planet with. So if we, you know, I think just understanding that should inform how we personally define our meaning and purpose. There's a paradox. I think it's true what Jennifer said that at a fundamental level, we all want the same thing, but everybody has their unique perspective on like how that's going to play out or what role they individually have to play in the greater good. And so I think we need a lot of dialogue um, to help us both understand and also appreciate and honor the differences that we bring. Um, and to work through conflicts that might emerge. I mean, I think that humanity is like, like as individuals, we're like cells in the body of humanity. You know, we each have to function in our own way fully, but we each have, I mean, if you think about our physical bodies, you know, our heart, the cells in our heart do different things than the cells in our bones or our lungs. We need them all, and we need them all to be working together, even though, you know, while they're doing kind of something that's different but complementary. And I think it's the same when you think about us as individuals. We're unique, we have our own role, and yet we're part of something bigger. I hope that makes some sense. I think so. I think so, absolutely. Um, Tom, did you have anything to add, add to this before we move on to another question? No? Okay. So um, we have another question here around the relationship between resilience and life meaning and purpose. What do you feel the relationship is? What, what can we learn from that? That's an interesting question. Um, I, I think that if we, again, know where our core alignment is, know what that core value is, it gives us a resilience to meet whatever is emerging in the moment. And what, it might explain a different way of expressing itself, but it's if we know kind of our core, you know, as Tom said, who we are deep down in there, what our values are. When everything else is stripped away, we can bring that to anything. Oh uh, yes, if I also may add something here, I, I do agree with Michelle that values are extremely important in both uh, personal and uh, social cultural sense and 
this time of, of uh, crisis is also a time of making decisions again at many levels from individual to really social and global. Uh, crisis is, is usually defined as, as, as that moment when we are forced by circumstances to choose which way we want to go. And for me, this COVID related uh, critical moment brings out this, this need in a very stark, stark way. Are we to go back to normal? Probably not. Why not? Because the old normal was not good. So the real question for us is to kind of uh, start working toward creating something that is better. And this time of crisis gives us a chance to do it. Actually, the time requires from all of us as individuals and, and members of communities to think in these, these uh, uh, terms. And uh, I think uh, what can help in this regard is to somehow determine, self-determine uh, the connection between values and, and actions. And what actually gives, gives meaning to our life many times is whether what we are doing is bringing us closer to realizing the values we are having for ourselves, how to live. And this, I think, applies to also our social life. And we are certainly, uh, as Michelle, you said, uh, part of this uh, body, politic, or social body. So uh, it's a big challenge for, for us to work uh, simultaneously at different, different levels. And I, I have a very surprising, uh, for some people, quote to, to read to you here. I think it kind of uh, fits well into, into this part of our discussion. So allow me to read it. It's a short one. Uh, the coincidence of the changing of circumstances and of human activity or self-changing can be conceived and rationally understood only as a revolutionary practice. So engaging in this revolutionary practice, we are doing uh, simultaneous change in ourselves and in a society or community we live in. And by the way, if you're wondering uh, where this quote is coming from, it's uh, from Karl Marx in his thesis about Feuerbach. Thank you, Tom. Um, if we could include that quote in the supporting documents, if you could send that to me after we're finished, I'll make sure that everybody can receive it. You know, when you're, you're speaking about resilience and um, it, it kind of wraps into some of the conversations that we were talking about, uh, about challenges that, and we're in a really challenging time right now. What does it mean for our individual sense of purpose? How can we turn this time into a teacher, a medicine? And not just individually, but collectively. How do we, how do we shift the future um, so that we're all living more meaningfully, uh, more in alignment with our purpose? You know, when structure, structures are shaky, this is such a, a beautiful time to reevaluate 
to dismantle what no longer serves us, to, to clear the, the belief systems and um, the systems that, that just don't work anymore. And they become exposed. I'm, I'm seeing so much exposed over the last uh, couple of months, uh, systemically in relationships and families, um, in so many different systems that we have in place. But not just the things that aren't working are being exposed. There's also an exposure of some things that are working. And I, I, adding energy to those things that, that work and allowing them to fuel us, to, to, to regenerate us, to help us align to, to those tools and strategies that, that make us stronger as individuals, as communities, as families. And I love how you, um, the, way, the way you were speaking about that, Tom, how the work that we're doing in collectively, it does, it does affect the individual, like that we're, we're very interconnected. And uh, I think everybody really touched on this interconnectivity that we all have in, um, in the organism that is our community or our family, um, humanity, and what what role do we have to play as individuals in the in the better functioning of this of this organism um so it is a it's a it's a powerful time right now for individual medicine as well as collective and community medicine so i think um with that we can wrap up for our our talk today we're just coming on to on to noon so it's been an hour um, I'd like to give deep gratitude and thanks to, to Tom and Michelle and Jennifer for their time today um, to be panelists to help us shape our purpose and meaning, deepen our sense of purpose and meaning in these challenging times and also beyond. And I'd also like to give uh, a deep gratitude for the, for the participants who, who gave their questions and really, um, really did some work today on deepening their own sense of meaning and asking what strategies and tools can help them find, you know, resilience, get through challenges, um, heal discrepancies within their, their own, their life. I hope it's been helpful for you all. And um, I'm really, uh, this series has been, um, gotten some really incredible feedback from folks, from participants. Um, and what we've decided at the Inner Arts Collective is we're going to be continuing with, with these. They're going to slow down. They're going to be bi-weekly moving forward. But if you um, can check out the, the website, Inner Arts Collective, and go into the events section, and you'll see in under healing and meditation events, the How We Heal series is posted there. And we also have listed all of the, the previous discussions in YouTube links. Um, as well as a list of the upcoming conversations over the next few months and panelists that have signed up for each of those conversations. If you'd like to see something discussed, I encourage you to reach out to me and let me know. Uh, and I would be happy to, to send the request out to our members and see if we can get a few panelists together for you. Um, it's as easy as that. And then we'll set up a date and it will come. So um, without further ado, um, I'd like to just thank you all. And yeah, you're very welcome. Relax and Hannah, um, thank you very much for, for joining us today. And for, for the folks, I know we have folks from different countries joining us today. Um, and it's really, it's really beautiful to see folks from different places in the world. It's, it's, a, it's a real pleasure. I hope it's been helpful for you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. It's really beautiful to spend the time.